Well, good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the forum tonight that is being put on by the League of Women Voters of White Bear Lake area. My name is Liz Lauder, and I am the president of the White Bear Lake area League of Women Voters, and I'm so glad you could all come out tonight. Uh, if, in case you don't know about us, uh, you might know us about, about us from our candidate forums during the election season, but uh, the League is always constantly working to, uh, towards a goal of a democracy where every eligible person has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate. And uh, we are a political organization in that we are interested in and participate in the political process. And we are also very proud of the fact that we do not support or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office at any level of government. Uh, the League was founded by suffragettes. And as our name suggests, we are very interested in the process of voting. And we work hard to protect the right to vote and to protect access to voting and to make sure that every vote counts. And that's why I'm so excited to have our speaker tonight, Paul Anderson, with us. Uh, he's a retired Minnesota Supreme Court Justice. He was first appointed by Governor Arne Carlson to the Minnesota Court of Appeals in 1991 and appointed as uh, Associate Justice to the Supreme Court in 1994. And he served at that post until he retired in 2013. Among the many things that he did while on the court, uh, Justice Anderson served on two special redistricting panels to decide legislative district boundaries when our legislators and our governors could not agree. Uh, redistricting is a process that happens every 10 years just after the census, and it determines who lives in which district and who doesn't. And this often becomes a politically charged uh, debate because lawmakers are basically choosing who gets to vote for them. Uh, Justice Anderson has spoken widely on the topic of voting, and tonight the title of his talk is Manipulating the Right to Vote, Redistricting, Gerrymandering, Voter ID, and More. Um, after his presentation, uh, he will be participating in a conversation with my fellow League members Lisa Larson and Kathy Tomzich and be taking questions from League members and from members of the audience. So would you please welcome Justice Paul Anderson. Well, I'm impressed with the turnout. Actually, I do know how, why the uh, DFL did well in the uh, suburbs. Good or bad weather, women turn out. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, was that, I can't, was that a little inappropriate? Uh, uh, oh, uh, no, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's nice to say, you know, you, you didn't introduce yourself as a political organization, and you are. But the key is that you're not a political organization with a capital P. It's a small p. Because politics is basically power. And uh, political science is the study of power and how it uh, gets uh, uh, used and uh, sometimes manipulated. And I'm going to talk to you about that tonight. Uh, I'll probably start by quoting Adlai Stevenson. He, uh, once in giving a speech, he said, my job is to speak to you for a while this evening. Your job is to listen to me this evening, and I really hope we finish our respective tasks about the same time. <laughs> and so, we're going to start, we're going to start, uh, you see, I said, it's a complicated title, but I need to uh, start with all these, because I'm going to focus on the right to vote, election procedures. I have fraud in quotes, because I don't like to use the term fraud. I'm talking about elections because there is very little fraud in elections, particularly in Minnesota. But there are people who like to label uh, some problems that occur in the election process as fraud. And they want to frighten you. And they want to think that all these kind of bad things are going to happen. And I want you to, I'm going to start by talking the right to vote and, and how you need to analyze what goes on in the election process. Uh, so let's get to the next slide. Okay, League of Women Voters versus Ritchie. Case in 2012. He 
can see it up there. Is the league relevant? Does it do anything of, of value? I have some mixed feelings, not anymore, but uh, let me say that at the time, in an earlier generation, you were kind of naive. Uh, you were populated by do-gooders. You thought that if, uh, you know, I, I went to uh, uh, Libya in uh, 2012. I met with Ambassador Stevens shortly before they killed him. And uh, I was somewhat cavalier about my safety over there. I subsequently talked to some people and said, Justice Anderson, you were being monitored very closely. And, uh, you know, if you come a little bit later, you could have been uh, very much the victim of kidnapping. But see, the thing that was going on in my mind, why I went to Libya to work with their election, is that I kind of this American idea, if you just do the right thing, if you show up and you're kind of promoting the good ends, you know, the benefit of the common wheel, that's all right. No, it isn't. Uh, not at all, because there were some evil forces at work in uh, Libya at the time. I was told that I was being monitored uh, probably constantly. But the same thing, I think, was an attitude that permeated the legal women voters early on. The idea of we just do what's good, we just do what's right, you know, it's going to be okay. Well, folks, it isn't okay. Because there are all kinds of forces out there in this whole political world that don't want the right thing to happen. They want it to ma manipulate because uh, power is at stake. And uh, you've gotten over that, though. You're a pretty sophisticated group now. You've uh, you've been banged up. I mean, uh, you know, I, I remember when you had these uh, voter panels in the 1990. You had uh, showed up, and you're going to have these voter juries, and you're going to decide based upon who the juries were that uh, made the right candidate. I remember the first one. We didn't pay too much. I worked for Arnie Carlson's campaign then. We didn't pay too much for to the first one, and uh, Doug Kelly did very well. Well, the reason he did well is that he paid attention. He got his people to show up to that jury, okay? Well, juries number two and three, Arnie did very well. You know why? We got our people to show up. You were being manipulated. We, you know, once you'd rather Kelly people, and then we got uh, understood, and we got our people there, and hey, they knew who they were going to vote for, no matter what the thing. So, that's when I want to talk about a little bit of your naivety. But that's, I'm talking ancient history. You're a pretty sophisticated group right now. And some of your sophistication uh, is shown in this case here. The ACLU and the legal women voters decided that they were going to challenge uh, the voter ID uh, amendment. There are two amendments, you know, in 2012. One dealt with uh, gay marriage. The other dealt with voter ID. I mean, well, I've I've always been of the not always. I guess I evolved that way. I'm not I'm always, a, but I mean, I, I was a supportive of the uh, uh, in opposition to the. I can say it now. I did not like the amendment that uh, was going to ban gay marriage because I don't think that the Constitution should uh, embody in its text something that is contrary to civil rights. Okay, don't know how I would have ruled if it came to the court, but that's how I view the the whole issue. But that amendment was fine because the whole amendment was on the ballot. You knew what it was about. You could read it, okay? What was wrong with the uh, voter ID amendment was it, well, I said it in my dissent. I said it was misleading. Uh, let's see what I said. It was uh, erroneous, misleading, and deceptive. And uh, the people who put it on there wanted it to be that way. And you made a mistake when you came. <laughs> Pavlovich, who came up before me, wanted us to, the court to take it off the ballot completely. No, legislators got a right to put the amendment on the ballot. But my point was, okay, you want to amend the Constitution? Put the whole thing on the ballot. Now it's going to be about four or five pages. <laughs> but all right, let the people know. Uh, rather than putting something that's on the ballot that's deceptive and misleading. Now, that case was argued before our court on July 17th. Earlier polling in May showed that somewhere between 75 and 80% of the people of the state of Minnesota favored that amendment. 
I wrote a 66-page dissent. Uh, but Justice Page also wrote a dissent. And uh, members, uh, uh, Arnie Carlson came out against it. Uh, Governor Dayton came out against it. And the people of Minnesota defeated it. And well, they should, because it's basically the current incarnation of the Jim Crow uh, rules, OK? And, and so why would people want it? Well, I'll give you one reason. See, I'm a 75-year-old white guy who's had the advantage of white male privilege all my life. So I got some power because of that, and I don't want to give it up. And so when I see all these, uh, uh, you know, people that, you know, skin color different than I am and whatever showing up to vote, I'm not sure they're going to want to keep me in power. And then, oh gosh, all these women, you know, they're, they're kind of power hungry and greedy. And so uh, I, I'm not sure I can exclude them uh, from voting, but I can exclude others. And so that's why you get amendments like that. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding when I say that I'm a, I, no, I'm not kidding when I'm the 75-year-old white guy who's had male privilege. That's true. But I'm uh, willing to share my power, OK? Uh, but what we did, going to get to the next slide, is that it was defeated. And this is where I want to focus on the right to vote. Uh, some danger of me injuring my elbow as I pat myself on the back as I read what I wrote. <laughs> Uh, but that's OK. Elections are the primary method used by the people to hold their leaders accountable. That's why elections are so important. Elections are an institutional, peaceful means by the which the people can revolt against those they have entrusted with limited sovereign power. See, we have institutionalized revolution in our country. It can happen every two years. We had a small revolution uh, earlier this week. We had some bigger ones uh, earlier this uh, uh, decade. and in the, But those are the revolutions. And it's a limited sovereign power, because the sovereign power comes from the people. Elections are the method the people use to hold those with sovereign power accountable or even remove those people from office when they fail to be responsive to the people's will. See, the sovereignty rests with the people. But in order to run a civil society under the rule of law, we give some of our sovereignty to elected officials. And we do that by voting them into office. But it's a limited grant of sovereignty, and we can take it back if we want. Uh, constitutions in a democracy embody and protect the basic right under which elections are implemented, the fundamental right to vote. The right to vote is why the case currently before our court is so important. We are addressing a case that involves the fundamental right and how that right will be embodied and uh, protected by the Minnesota Constitution. That's, that's what it's all about, folks. I mean, this fundamental right to vote that's protected in the Constitution, which uh, embodies the idea that you have sovereignty and you can give it and not give it to some of your elected officials, but you can take it back and you do it through the ballot box. So that's why the issue we're talking about tonight is so important. So we can get to the next. Oh, yes. Oh, gosh, you have heard all these. There's so much fraud in the election process. And these evil people out there who are willing to uh, do anything to keep power. Yeah, there are evil people, and there has been fraud. But if you leave here tonight, I want you to leave with a clear understanding. There is a spectrum of behavior with respect to voting. And very little of it amounts to fraud. There can be, and has been in the past, but uh, when people talk to you about fraud, I want you to be able to respond and say, tell me what you're speaking of. Are you speaking about ignorance by the voters? There's a lot of ignorance by voters. It's, uh, anyway, we want to educate the voters how to vote right. We can't, you know, this is interesting. When I was in the Philippines talking about elections and they had a complicated ballot, I said, you've got to be careful that you don't, in your attempt to educate, you don't overdo it. You make it appear so complicated and so difficult that people won't vote because they figure, I, I can't do it. You've got to make it clear and simple but you've got to tell them how to do it. Negligence, well, there's a lot of negligence that occurs. In. Manipulation is the one that I'm going to focus on most tonight. Then you have malfeasance and then felony criminal behavior. If we do the next slide, what is ignorance? Well, listen, voters don't know. 
how they're voting. Uh, I will tell you flat out that in the 2008 election, Al Franken got the plurality of all the valid votes cast in the state of Minnesota that were brought to our attention. I can't tell you who got the most votes that were cast because there were some votes that uh, uh, just didn't count because there was ignorance and they were improperly filled out and whatever. And a lot of that stems from the uh, lack of knowledge of voters and how to do it. Uh, we revised the uh, absentee ballot procedure in Minnesota, so we make it a little more understandable, less complicated. Uh, Georgia, you see there, is that uh, even if you're not ignorant down in Georgia, the Secretary of State was setting it up so that uh, uh, you would have problem uh, uh, voting. But we want to eliminate ignorance so people can cast their ballots so they get counted. I mean, in my uh, opinion, in uh, the uh, Coleman Franklin thing, I just quoted a uh, Tom Stoddard, the playwright uh, from the play Jumpers, and said, it's not the voting that matters, it's the counting. Well, the voting matters, yes, but you gotta do it right so it gets counted. A little side story on that is that my colleague Alan Page uh, quoted uh, Joseph Stalin, saying that I don't matter, who, I don't care who votes as long as I get to count. Now, there, now there's no way I'm going to cite in a voting rights case uh, that butcher of 36 million people. So I told Alan, I said, I can't join you in that, and I'm going to do my own. And so I go to a kind of a left-wing uh, playwright from England, Tom Stoddard. But it's the same point. It's not, he said, not the voting that matters, it's the counting. Well, they both matter. See, voting is speaking. It's, it's a real simple concept. You speak when you cast your ballot. When it's properly counted, you get heard. So think of that, the two concepts, speaking and being heard. And they're both equally important in this process. You gotta speak in the correct manner, and then the people who are listening, hey, the counters and all that, gotta make sure you're heard. Now, negligence. Uh, that can t come in many forms. Election officials uh, uh, designing Florida, 2000. I don't think there was a lot of pro fraud there, but boy, was there a negligence. I would even say in Florida it was gross negligence that they designed a ballot that where you thought you were voting for uh, Gore, you would vote for Buchanan, and then when you voted, you punch something where the Chad hung in place and you need to try. That is pure negligence upon the part of the elected officials in uh, Florida. Not Bush's fault, not Gore's fault, they just didn't do it right. Another example would be in our neighborhood, one of my neighbors used to be election judge. She's very conscientious, good person and everything else. And they had one place in Inver Grove Heights you could go to cast your uh, ballot beforehand. It was City Hall. So you wouldn't have any opportunity to show up at the wrong precinct because the election official there would know your precinct and put it down and your vote would pass. And so neighbors, used to be neighbors, they moved out of the neighborhood, went to vote, engaged with conversation with the election judge who was their former next door neighbor. The election judge put down the old precinct, and uh, not the news precinct. So this, I mean, people who know me on the court, they know that I'm, I'm pretty meticulous, and I read the record and look at the details. So I wanted to check. First of all, I wanted to check in 2008. I was on the ballot as a judge. I wanted to see if my mother's absentee ballot counted for me. If I were your last chance to vote for me, I want to see. Yeah, it did. No problem there. <laughs> but then I, then I looked, and you know, and I saw. Wait a second. Why are these people's vote not uh, being counted? And it was the wrong precinct was put in. It wasn't their fault. Negligence on behalf. So bad thing. By the way, I made sure their vote got counted. Uh, but anyway, now manipulation. Let's get to the next slide. This is the biggie. This is what we're going to talk about most tonight. Because there is a lot of manipulation going on by the powers to be that want to stay in power. I mean, ID requirements, Alabama. They passed a voter ID 
requirement that you use your driver's license as an identifier for the, the secondary form of identification is really hard to get. So, but they say driver's license, that's going to do it. So what do they do after they pass that? They close 67 driver's license facilities. Some people have to drive over 100 miles to get their driver's license. And it just so happens that many of those areas are in rural or black sections of Alabama. That's manipulation. The same way as only having a limited number of voting machines uh, and limiting the location of polling places. Uh, Ohio purging the voters list that, uh, I mean, a lot of people show up and they, I think it's four years they were using and a lot of people have been voted for all the time and they were out, they missed a lot of selection, they showed up and say, you're not registered anymore, you didn't vote the last election. Well, I mean, that's, and uh, undercounting certain classes of votes, you know, residents, the census, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But this is the main thing. Let's talk about the next slide. Malfeasance and felony. Malfeasance is low-level criminal. Oh, you got the college student going to McAllister College. There, it comes from Illinois. Doesn't get their uh, registration changed. Uh, it's presidential election. Oh, they want to vote for president, and so they show up at a local precinct by McAllister, ask for a ballot, and vote. Now they want to vote for president, but they got all these other names on the ballot. They're not entitled to vote for them. Yeah, you, and so it's a crime to do that. You shouldn't do that. I mean, there's a responsibility to vote where you are registered to vote and do it right. And so it's, I mean, this is the thing I'm going to talk about. It's sometimes people who are on paper as uh, felons is that they've been convicted but released from prison, but they're on. Uh, Paper still the probation is that, and you know, I think about these people, they've been told since grade school their civic duty is to vote, okay? And the election comes up and they want to vote, and uh, but they're disenfranchised. Inordinate number of persons of color in our state who are disenfranchised this way. See, I, I think that we'll change that the next legislation because. Um, the, the change in the House. The House is blocking it. I think they probably have enough critical mass in the Senate. See, I am of the opinion is that what better time to educate somebody about their civic duty than when you got them on paper and they're subject to your supervision. You can tell them to find out where their election place is, the poll. They can figure out. You don't tell them how to vote. Just tell them, you know, uh, who to vote for. But you can tell them how to vote and get them to know and say, that, you know, this is kind of the way that you come back into society after you've violated the rules. And so uh, we may get that and we may not. But, you know, it's, yeah, it's wrong to do it. Oh, and some people made a big deal about it in the election of, uh, 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 I think they made it in 2016, again in 2012. Uh, but it's low level. And it's wrong. And it's maybe, a, uh, they're scuff laws. You know what a scuff law is? It's an invented word. I love that word. As a, as a judge and a lawyer, I love that word. It's an invented word. See, in 1924, the Boston Globe ran a contest to come up with a word to describe citizens who did not follow the law on prohibition. It's a hard law for a lot of people to, to I mean, you know, we talk about Stearns County, one of the great centers of uh, illegal alcohol in the United States during prohibition. And I was in a play and I added in the line, you know, those good people up in uh, Stearns County, you know, they. They treat alcohol and beer as bread, you know? You know, they, uh, it's called it liquid bread. Of course, they drink it like water, but <laughs> I had a little fun with that. But no, it's uh, scuff law is somebody who sees a law that's on the books, but it doesn't make sense and they don't follow the, the law. So we have some scuff laws that follow in the malfeasance area. Fraud, criminal, very few examples of that. We've had some big examples in the past. I mean, uh, the Democrats stole the election uh, of 1960 based on fraud. Uh, two cases, just two states, Illinois, Mayor Daley, uh, infamous what he did. And then uh, uh, Linda Johnson, he, he was on the ballot for good reason. He had a few counties out there, particularly in the southern part of Texas, that he just had them wait till the end and see how many votes were needed. And uh, so they came in late. 
And lo and behold, there are enough votes there to put them over the top. That's fraud. But there's very little example. Now, when we had the Coleman Franken case in front of us, I knew that there are a lot of people out there screaming fraud. Oh, by the way, there are still people that sensitive think, oh, that was fraud, whatever. When both the attorneys, uh, Joe Freeberg for Coleman, Mark Elias for Franken, uh, when they were arguing before the court, I said, counsel, did you find any example of fraud in this election? A little bit of silence. I said, counsel, I'm just asking the question. Did you find any example of fraud? Freeberg said no. Mark Elias came up. He said, counsel, did you find any examples of fraud as you went through this? No. No, Your Honor, we did not. Now, afterwards, both Elias and Freeberg said they knew exactly what I was doing because I was asking that question so that it could get into the opinion. And sure enough, there it is in the opinion. Both counsel before the court said to the court on the record that they found no fraud in the election because there are a lot of people who, I mean, even though the counsel said that, they still, they said, you know, they want to believe that something's wrong. They want to believe fraud. So if you leave here with nothing else, I want you to understand these behaviors that are related to voting. I want you to be educated, and I want you to engage people in conversation uh, who say, now, a lot of them aren't going to listen to you because they want to believe what they believe, but you should be prepared to say that's wrong, okay? And so take that with you when you leave. Okay, let's see what my next slide is. Oh, one man, one vote. Why do we have that? Supreme Court said Baker versus Carr, and then Reynolds versus uh, Sims basically say that you know, Senate, you know, it's all based on statehoods. When I run into somebody from Wyoming, I always ask the question, why do you think you're entitled to two senators? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean the, the best answer they give is, well, it says so in the Constitution. They're absolutely right. But I give them a hard time. I said the same thing up in Alaska. And then Reynolds versus Sims says that this whole idea, one man, one vote, applies to the states. So starting in the 1960s, we had to look at how district lines were drawn. And, uh, you know, we had some really distorted lines. But gerrymandering goes back, you know, a long way, though. Uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that. The Supreme Court right now is changing the landscape. Uh, oh, I have there, it's, it's just a smaller type than I should have it. The Civil Rights Act of 1965. Uh, that was a seminal act. LBJ was right. He said, as soon as I sign this, we're going to uh, assign the South away to the Republicans forever. And we are going to have, uh, uh, by the time he said, well, hey, I started out as a Republican. I'm a Lincoln Republican. All right. Lincoln, Grant, Garfield, Youngdahl, Stassen, and Minnesota. Because one of the things I didn't like about the Democratic Party was they were so much in support of uh, deprived uh, civil rights in the South. You know, in 1924, I'm doing a play at the Landmark Center about a, uh, Billy Francis, who was a prominent black attorney in uh, Minnesota in the 20s, and he was the head of the Negroes for Coolidge nationwide, okay? He led so why were the uh, African-American population in favor of Coolidge? Because Coolidge was the one that stood up and said, we need to protect African-Americans, right? At the 1924 National Democratic Convention, for the 103rd ballot, they nominated Cox. One third, just slightly under one third, of the delegates to that convention were enrolled KKK members. Enrolled KKK members. That doesn't mean there weren't some others that were. I mean, so that's kind of why my tradition is uh, Father Abraham, and that is Republican. But, you know, with the Civil Rights Act, what followed is it's just kind of flipped. And is that now the uh, Republicans have the South. Uh, message here, don't plan on the Supreme Court protecting your rights that much anymore. Uh, it's a different Supreme Court. Uh, that was one of the big issues uh, going on underneath uh, with Kavanaugh. I didn't like Kavanaugh's position, executive power, arbitration, a lot of issues. And I've got to be frank with you, I believe, the, I believe Dr. Ford. And, uh, and that, no, 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 don't applaud. You all start from a place on that. I start from the place that I've looked at so many criminal records over 20 years. I can kind of have a good idea what's credible behavior and non-credible behavior, who's covering. That's how I came to the conclusion. 
So, you know, don't applaud, just understand it. You've got to be able to look at it, how you come at it objectively. But the Supreme Court says we don't need the Civil Rights Act of 1965 anymore. The problem's been solved. Now, they're right in part, but see, the Civil Rights Act applied to states in the South. And they said, well, you know, that's unfair and we don't need it there. And say, we're going to get rid of it. See, I don't mean to criticize the Supreme Court, but I will. Because uh, <laughs> they didn't get it. We still need the Civil Rights Act that came in force in uh, 1965 to protect your right to vote. The defect is that it only applied to the South. It should apply nationwide. Because the problems that it addressed are now nationwide problems. And so it should be and say, OK, the problem still exists. We won't throw it out with respect to the South. Hey, but Congress, get on the ball here and make sure that it applies all over the nation. I don't think the uh, Supreme Court is going to help us out on that uh, issue of voting rights. Uh, God, it's just, it's painful. He's very smart. It's painful to know that now the swing vote is Roberts. It was painful enough when it was Kennedy. Yeah, but now it's Roberts. But I don't have too much faith in the new justices. I can say that because I'm no longer on the court. Next one. Uh, Donald Trump warns people to beware of non-existent voter fraud. Lack, lack of proof aside, Chris Kobeck can't stop talking about voter fraud in the Kansas governor's race. Geo Clay, I mean, just be sophisticated consumers of administration. They want you to be afraid. They want you to scare. Now, Chris Kobeck in Kansas is touting and saying uh, a, a voter fraud message that or measure that he helped get passed. It was overturned by the court, but he's so blatantly illegal. That didn't matter to Kobeck. He's still saying this is a good thing. Now, it's very interesting, though. Uh, Thomas Frank wrote the book, What's the Matter with Kansas? Because of, you know, there's some people in, in north central uh, Kansas that they vote against their interests. Huh? Kobeck didn't get elected. They elected a, uh, a woman governor. And, uh, and I think uh, this is one thing on some of these issues. You've got to watch for the people, not always, but sometimes when people overreach, I mean, they have to pay the uh, paper for it. So anyway, no. But fear is something that people want to instill with you. And that's why I go back to your sophisticated understanding of what goes wrong in this in human institution of voting. It's not fraud. There are a lot of other things that go wrong. Let's see what the next slide is. i got to watch for a time. Uh, you get the bad, real bad case down in uh, Georgia. It's still up in the air. Uh, you know, is that I guess today is that uh, Kemp uh, resigned as Secretary of State. No, that's no big deal because he stayed in office long enough to manipulate things. Uh, and, and one of the ways to try to manipulate it was this technical requirement. Everything on the ballot application had to match. I mean, I'm not sure they went as far as requiring that the commas and the periods be in the right place, but it was almost that ridiculous. Now, some people said that there were over close to a million people disenfranchised. No, the real number is probably somewhere in the uh, 50 to 75,000. That's a lot of votes in a race where uh, Kemp is now at 50.3, Stacey Adams is at 48.6. I mean, and she wants a recount. She's not going to get enough votes to uh, uh, win, but if he gets under 40, uh, 50 percent, then there has to be a runoff. But that's, and so my point here is that it matters who's your Secretary of State. Uh, Catherine Harris down in uh, Florida embarrassed herself in the state the way she uh, uh, played it. We've had pretty good secretaries of state. I mean, Steve Simon, I know Steve well, Mark Ritchie. Oh, he's vilified by the, the Democrats. I've sat on kind of canvassing boards with him, and no, I mean, you know, he's not because he wants to get it done. Let's go to the next slide here. Ah, gerrymandering. Now we'll get to gerrymandering, and what is it? To manipulate the boundaries, see my middle term, manipulation, that's what gerrymandering is, manipulation of the length so as to favor one party or class, an instance of gerrymandering. It's been around for a long time. See the next slide. Gets its name from this salamander-like looking figure from uh, uh, Massachusetts in, uh, let's see, uh, Eldridge Gary was uh, vice president for Madison. 
So it would have been in the early uh, 1800s. And so he designed the district to get all the votes that were favorable to him. And it's Governor Jerry. I mean, he's a patriot. He uh, was a founder, signed the Declaration of Independence, didn't sign the Constitution because he didn't think it protected individual rights enough. That's why we have the Bill of Rights. Governor, whatever. And uh, I love it. There are going to be a couple of... So you get Jerry, G-E-R-R-Y, and Mander, just like a salamander. But it's been a long time. You know, some of you familiar with American history is that uh, yeah, Garfield, when he was running for president, had the front porch campaign. You know, presidents didn't do a lot of campaigning, but he kind of pushed the envelope a little bit and had people gather on his front lawn talking with front porch. He had that front porch as a result of gerrymandering because uh, the Democrats wanted to, you know, not to get him back into uh, Congress, so they redesigned his district. So he had to move. He moved 20 miles across the other line where his old district was, bought a new house that had this wonderful front porch. That's how come he campaigned from that <laughs> little, little, little tidbit of history. Let's go on here. Okay, both parties do it. This is Maryland. There's no coincidence that the Supreme Court took a case out of Maryland and uh, also Wisconsin. Wow. I mean, I know that Maryland is odd-shaped as a state, and I know that it's got a lot of water, but that, it, that takes a lot of innovation to come up with that. Oh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Minnesota redistricting or whatever. I mean, when I started working on it, I mean, it was the scissors, cut and paste, and maps, and scratch tape and whatever. Now it is so sophisticated, they can identify as much as even a house on a block and move it in a particular way to make the district uh, uh, comport to what they want. Let's come up with another one. Oh, by the way, go back to that one, would you? See, I love this. You know, you got the gerrymandering. This is called the praying mantis district. <laughs> okay. Animals tend to... Let's go to the next one. This is out of Pennsylvania. This one is called Goofy Kicking Donald. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, uh, it was a big, it's a big deal in Pennsylvania. Let's go to the next slide. And what is going on here? I mean, you've got to watch out for it from both sides. Uh, Minnesota has generally been pretty good. You can't really read this, but uh, I'm going to read what it says here because it's important. So whichever party is in power can draw the congressional districts to their advantage so they can swing elections in their favor. Yeah. And so they have the one person say, yeah. We're your elected officials. And the other guy says, exactly. We decided, uh, 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 we decided who were our voters. <laughs> That's what gerrymandering is about. They don't decide, let you decide who they want to elect. They want to decide who the voters are that vote for them. Okay, next one. Oh, I love this line. It's, I mean, it's, it's a, yeah. It's, these are two legislators from North Carolina state that's pretty evenly balanced in presidential elections, 13 congressional seats. And these are the individuals in the legislature who designed it so that 13, of the 13, 10 seats go Republican. The guy on the left, when asked, why is it that in a state that's so easily divided, you have uh, 10 of the 13 districts that uh, go to Republicans? His answer was, well, we tried for 11, but we just couldn't figure out how to do it. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, many of these people take great pride in their ingenuity and design. They don't, they're not shamed at all by what they do. So that's why I like to, I mean, you can see the smiles on their faces. They look at the man, gosh, you know, how could we have gotten that 11th one? Let's go to the next one. Okay. Now, this is important in how courts play a role. Pennsylvania is an evenly balanced state. 13 of the 18 congresspersons were Republican. Evenly balanced, but 13 out of 18. The thing about Pennsylvania that's different is because it's an evenly balanced state and they do have a quasi-party uh, designation for the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is Democrat. And so when the redistricting thing came to the, you know, Goofy, uh, the Donald kicking, uh, Goofy kicking Donald came up, whatever, it went to the Supreme Court there, and they redrew the lines. Go to the next slide. 
And interesting is that it's a huge deal. I'm going to tell you why. But the Supreme Court rejected the plea from uh, uh, Pennsylvania to have it reviewed. And this is important because it goes back to the 1990s when the U.S. Supreme Court, Scalia was one of the leaders on it, said redistricting should be a state issue and not a uh, federal issue. Ryan Costello, good guy, actually. He's pretty moderate, decent, uh, very civic-minded, whatever. He announced that he would drop his bid for re-election in Pennsylvania because when the court did the redistricting, he knew that he didn't have much chance in his, his district. And so what happened, let's see what the next slide is here. Uh, what happened in, oh, this is Ohio. What happened in Pennsylvania, I mean, I think, you know, there's going to be a gain maybe somewhere about seven or eight seats by the, so that they're over the majority. Four seats flipped in Pennsylvania just because of the court redistricting that was more fair, more balanced. I mean, that's what's at stake here. I mean, big time. That's why Pennsylvania was such a big time. They didn't allow, go to the next one here. They didn't allow uh, any of the redistricting to be done in Ohio. And uh, Governor Devine, Republican, won again. So there's not much chance that there's going to be a change in Ohio. And so difference between Pennsylvania and Ohio, part of the blue wall that the Democrats talk about, you're still going to see something like this. Go to the next one. And this is how it happens. You see, uh, in Ohio, you have a district down here, 60.6% uh, voted Democrat. You concentrate the other party's votes in a particular district. And it's generally easier for the Republicans to do it than the uh, Democrats because so much of the uh, Democratic support is concentrated in the cities and you can uh, concentrate. But you see how these districts, the margin is so high. And so you, you concentrate. That's how you do it. Let's go to the next slide. This is how you manipulate redistricting. On the left, you know, is that you just do a kind of straight boundary geographic, 60% blue, 40% red. You do it another way here, and you still come out with uh, uh, three districts, uh, uh, five districts, they all turn out blue, okay, you can do it there. But if you want them to come out red, go over to the right. See how you do that? They don't get all the districts like they're trying to do in North Carolina, but they got, uh, uh, see, well, they got at least uh, three out of the five, just because they drew the lines as you see them there. So that's how you do it. And you have the sophisticated computer software that allows you to really be much more sophisticated than those rather broadly drawn lines. Let's go to the next one. Okay. This is big time. You will see that the Democrats are pleased that they got an increase in the governorships. I think it's uh, uh, eight new governors, and uh, they have uh, gotten at least one house in, I think, about eight other states. Uh, and this is the point that the governors, the Democratic governors conference, invested a lot of money in governors' races because they knew that this was uh, going to be important in 2020 as a result. See, what we have now is the result of the 2010 election. Do you know what happened in 2010? That was the Tea Party election and the reaction to uh, Obama, you know, another revolution. A, a revolution in 2008, a counter-revolution in 2010, took over a lot of governorships, a lot of state houses, and I will tell you, it's bad on both sides. But why gerrymandering is such an issue? Why are you thinking? Is it basically as a result of the 2010 uh, election? And uh, there was badly overreaching by the Republicans. Like I told you in North Carolina, you know, is it complaining they couldn't get the 11th uh, out of the manipulation? So this is why there was a lot of attention paid to governor's races. Democrats are reasonably feeling good about it. They wanted to get Florida. They didn't. I don't think they had much chance to beat uh, Devine, and, uh, but they want Georgia. But uh, nine of the 
10 most populous states at least have a divided situation. So maybe there's going to be some change on redistricting. Let's go to the next one. I should keep moving. And uh, this is, the census is very important because uh, they, uh, go, uh, Wilbur Ross, Secretary of Commerce, which they want the question about citizenship and other things. To the extent that you undercount people who you think will vote the opposite way, it's to your advantage. That's why they want that census uh, question on there, because if it diminishes some of the population, then uh, more likely they can concentrate the number of votes as they go for them. So here's, and this is a headline I like because it makes my point. The Republicans did get greedy following 2010. That's why it's such a big issue. Gerrymandering has been around for a long time, but people are really starting to pay attention to it. And I think it's part of the attention because it's, uh, they just got greedy. Let's go forward to the next one. I love this one. <laughs> this is, I mean, we got a, actually, Kansas, there's some hope for the rural vote, but. Minnesota, the country is really divided, rural, metro, suburban. But this is Texas. And they refer to Houston and Austin as being blueberries in a bowl of tomato soup. <laughs> and so, I mean, uh, Austin is blue, Houston is blue. And so what they did in uh, uh, Texas is, is they brought about five or maybe six districts coming into Austin, each of those districts taking a little bit of Austin and then going out into the rural area. And so is that uh, they dilute the Democratic vote in, uh, in Austin. Now, and I'm, I know your Republicans in this group will be offended, but I'm going to tell you quite frankly, the biggest offender here are the Republicans because they got greedy. But that doesn't mean that if the Democrats were in the same position, they might not. Well, they might not be so greedy. Now, I have an example of Minnesota on that. Let's go to the next one. Uh, folks, it's going to get worse. Power is power, and people are going to uh, uh, try to keep in power. And this, you can do the next one. This, this is a book that talks about how it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, democracy is on the ballot. We'll go to the next one. Just be aware it's going to get worse. Now, this is not the best thing, but as you can see, the state of Minnesota was congressional districts. Now, you need to understand something about congressional redistricting. We have some constraints in Minnesota on how we redistrict. You can see them on the map. There are Canada, the Dakotas, Iowa, Wisconsin, and Lake Superior. So you got those exterior uh, boundaries there. Uh, but then you got to divide it up within, uh, uh, you know, how you divide it up within the side. And uh, let's go to the next slide. I think it's a little clear. I and mean, this is the house districts. And then go to the next one. This is the this is where the core of the vote turned out in the, the metropolitan districts. Let's do the next one and see if, nope, we've got to go back to the one that has the whole state. Is that when the court, because we've had divided government in Minnesota since the 1970s when the redistricting came, so in each of those years it's gone to courts. Three of those went to the federal court. Now, two and a half and three and a half because in 1990 it was when it was switching from state to federal. Uh, but I had a lot to do with choosing the panel. I mean, I was involved in redistricting in 1970, 1980, and also was with Arnie Carlson when he botched the veto in 1990. And they tended to have three judge panels. And the history in Minnesota on redistricting with respect to that is federal Eighth Circuit Judge Gerald Haney, Democrat, close friend of Humphrey, good guy, good guy in many ways. He was, he was uh, one of the first on the beach in Normandy. He was third in command in his uh, landing craft. The captain who was in charge, the hatch dropped down, said, men, follow me, and he starts to leave and he gets shot and killed. First lieutenant is in charge now. He turns to the man and says, follow me. We're gonna go. He gets shot and killed. Now Cheney, uh, Haney's in charge. He said, men, go over the side. <laughs> true, it's, a, it's a true story. I mean, it, it is, OK? Uh, <laughs> he saw what happened to it. But Haney just loved redistricting. He used to go around with maps and whatever. He wasn't so concerned about uh, state legislature or whatever, but he was always concerned about uh, how uh, uh, the uh, 
congressional districts where it's more of a federal person than, and uh, I, I was, you know, I, in 1970, I knew all the parties in 80, uh, with Paul Magnuson, Judge Paul Magnuson, we were represented the House uh, uh, Republican minority, and then, and it used to be so frustrating because when they chose the panel, they would paint you. Then they'd choose another strong Democrat. And then they'd kind of trick a weak or an ambi Republican. <laughs> I mean, I mean um, Alsop was somewhat strong, and he wrote a strong dissent in uh, 1980, but then was convinced to tone it down a little bit. Uh, but it tended to be Democrat-oriented in the state of Minnesota those years. But there wasn't a lot of overreaching, and particularly with the state legislature, because if you study the legislative elections those years, you saw that the, both parties had majorities, particularly in the House. And so there was a chance for both parties that they could get a majority, okay? So there was some overreaching, but not uh, a whole lot, okay? And, uh, and so what's going to come up next is that there's a couple of things that I talk about. One, I hated having a three-judge panel decide redistricting. Because, you know, come on, you get two on one side and then somebody writes a dissent, you don't know whether there's something wrong or not. So our court, then, when we got it in 2000, 2010, we started, I mean, the rest of the court wanted a three-judge panel, we're gonna do it. I was the only one who said, no, I don't want that. And I had to fight tooth and nail to get five. Uh, because I thought with five, we could get a fairly equal balance. We'd get a couple of court of appeals and somebody from the north, somebody from the metro, and somebody from the south. Uh, and so uh, we had a five-judge panel. By the way, in 2000 and 2010, when the panel came out with this redistricting plan, we were one of the few states that had no appeal. People didn't like it, but they knew it was fair. And I'll, I'll visit that. But it's gonna be dicey coming up in 2020. Minnesota is entitled to somewhere about 7.39 Congress seats. We may lose a Congress seat. And I'm actually going to write Colin Peterson and urge him to run one more time. Because if he wins one more time and then retires after 2020, well, then we get up. it's a little easier because you're not dealing with somebody. Uh, but a couple of things that the court had for criteria. Minneapolis and St. Paul are two separate districts. Made sure that when the court does redistrict, you do not put the two cities together. The Republican plan was put the two cities. No, that's a radical change. We don't do that. And uh, and so, but what's going to be interesting, depending who's in charge, I've always thought that the northern 25% of Minnesota would be one district, a good district, okay? And uh, then you divide the rest. Actually, when the panel redid it in 2010, they figured that Interstate 90 was a better connector of uh, a district than uh, uh, Federal Highway Number 2 up north. That's a two-lane highway up north. Interstate 90 is four lanes, 25 miles south to uh, Iowa, 50 miles north within the state. So that's why we have uh, that district. Uh, Fian uh, lost it. Uh, uh, Hagedorn won it by a small uh, percentage. Uh, Colin Peterson in it is in the seventh. And I thought, you know, maybe we should combine the order, but the panel said, you know, that seventh district is pretty much agriculture. Agriculture unites, agriculture unites that district, Red River Valley, whatever, whereas the 8th district is the mining and fine forests and whatever. Don't know what's going to happen, you know, if we lose one seat and it's going to be fruit basket uh, upset. It's going to be hard to do. Okay, let's keep going on. I've, I'm running out of time here. Okay, here's all the districts. Minnesota is turning very red out state. Big numbers when it turns out state. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to confess to you, I find it very frustrating. I'm a farm kid. I grew up milking cows. Cows are Holstein. My color of a tractor is green. I, uh, you know, I know enough to say that the New Holland had the best baler. Uh, all of these things. And when I first came on the court, there weren't that many uh, justices who identified with the greater Minnesota. So I spent a lot of time out in greater Minnesota. I got to tell you how frustrating it is for me now when I go out to greater Minnesota and they don't trust me. They label me as uh, 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 urban, suburban, elite, 
who doesn't understand their needs. I quoted in the paper there uh, complaining about, you know, is it how the metropolitan area wants to control and one of the farmers, how it turning out there actually says, well, you know, all you want to do is suck the taxes out of our good, rich, black dirt out here. I said, well, I'm not sure we do that because the metro sends money outstate rather than you sending it in. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, I got the papers, show it. But that's kind of the, they see us as, uh, you know, sucking the riches out of the uh, uh, greater Minnesota area. And uh, so I, I tend to ask questions, but I don't like it that they suspect me just because I'm from the city. <coughs> I am. See, I grew up in Eden Prairie. Eden Prairie is, uh, you know, kind of, you know, it's kind of, Eden Prairie is kind of like a diamond city. You don't move to Eden Prairie, you achieve it, aren't you? But, you know, Anderson Lakes out in Prairie is named after my family. There are only 3,000 people in Eden Prairie when I grew up. There are only 30 in my graduating class, okay? So I am rural, as I say. And it's, it just kind of hurts me sometimes it's just because, you know, yeah, I've been lucky but to what I do, but I still, you know, I'm, I've done a lot of stuff internationally, lectured in China four times, Libya, Tunisia, uh, Russia, whatever, but I can, you know, you still carry that baggage with you. I'm walking in the Forbidden City being escorted by some pretty high officials, whatever, I said, you know, are they going to find out I'm just this farm kid who grew up in my country because you carry that image with you, and so it bothers them to me that, uh, uh, well, I gotta keep going on just a little bit. I wanna share with you some things. We are a divided nation, keep moving. This is a chart from the New York Times, is that the middle is, if you see, women, their history of voting tends to be blue. And it's strong, it, it ebbs and flows a little bit, uh, but it's very strong on the blue side. Men, oh, it's getting very strong on the uh, red side. Uh, a little less so this election. And see, I don't get it. I mean, Obama had it kind of right when he was talked to a heckler, says, I don't get it, why are you so mad? You won, you know? Uh, uh, and, but there is a lot of concern by men feeling marginalized, uh, feeling that they are left out. Uh, the last deep recession was very hard on men because they frequently lost their jobs and uh, said they were dependent on their wife's income for uh, benefits, whatever. And uh, so it, it really went to the core of their identity, more so than women, and they need somebody to blame. And uh, it's hard to blame your wife. And so they blame uh, immigrants and others. And there's just kind of this, and, and uh, you know, is it, Politicians know that it works to fan the flames or feed that fear. And so it's, uh, I mean, there's a war up in, I mean, I'll take it a moment just because I picked up a memo. She's out in northern Minnesota, and she was interviewed on CNN, and she said how fearful she is with that uh, invading horde that's coming uh, from Mexico, and what they're going to do is they're going to come up northern Minnesota during the wintertime and occupy vacant cabins, destroy them, uh, and live there, and then uh, when spring comes, they're going to disappear. <laughs> true, true. I mean, it's totally the same that. I mean, and this whole kind of this enclave uh, uh, mentality. So fear is something that's being fueled a lot. Let's go to the next one. Here you have the racial culture divides. The blue side is that you have black, Latino, Asian, and Caucasians tend to be on slightly on the right side, uh, on the red side, that's because of the large number of men who, are, so it, it just it illustrates, we are divided, we are divided, get me to the last, and see here it is on income, and we're divided on, I'm just, I, I, I love history, the latest book is Doris Curtin Goodwin's book on, uh, on uh, leadership, and uh, Teddy Roosevelt is talking about the concern about the income divide that occurred around the turn of the last century between 19, the 19th and 20th century. We have that same thing happening in our society now, and is that, uh, you know, is that 
You don't get the votes turn out in the higher income, but you get the money to turn out. I mean, how many pieces of literature did you get? I mean, and why would anybody want to run for office to be vilified for that? I mean, you know, you know, I know Eric Paulson. He's a decent guy, a little shy. That caused him trouble. But to send out that ad about the, uh, was it the Alina board? and say that the board is responsible for failing to, I mean, did you see the letter in the newspaper? All of these uh, pillars of society who are charitable donors saying, what are you doing labeling us as, you know, is that, I mean, now, uh, that was probably, I don't think Eric probably knew about that, but it was sent out by one of those groups that puts money into his campaign. And uh, I'm going to end before we get to question here. I am almost moving to where I think we should have the Australian system, where it's against the law, not to vote. Uh, you pay a fine, you don't go to jail. But see, if everybody has to vote, if you put the trust of many of these ads, okay, you are one of those voters out there that's right in the middle, okay? I'm gonna first see if I can get you to kind of go my way, but you know, you're, you're in the middle. I vote for the best person, I don't think. And then what I want to do, I want to get you mad at Oprah. Mm -hmm. I want to get you so irritated with some all. I'm not going to vote for either of them. It's called self-disenfranchisement. Yeah, and true. so many of those negative ads are wanting you to self-disenfranchise. Mm -hmm. But if you have to vote, I'm not going to run the risk that I want to irritate you with my negative ads. So hopefully I'll still kind of paint the other guys kind of bad. But I don't want to go too bad because I know you're going to vote. And you know, I want to come off the positive. We have a remarkably uh, sane governor's race. Uh, I know both of them well. Uh, they're both nice people, and they they kept it to a reasonable tone. Uh, is that I, mean, I, I had a wall sign in my yard. Well, my wife finally says, oh, gosh, Paul, you're off the court. I can put up political signs now. Uh, but, uh, but they were both decent people and they kept it to a reasonable tone. The uh, attorney general's race got a little nasty. Uh, you can ask me about that afterwards. I won't volunteer on it now, but you can if you want. Okay, is that it, I think. So we have about 25 minutes for questions. Now, I used to say this when I was the court for the young people or whatever, ask any question you want. There are no dumb questions. You can just ask whatever you want. I'm, I'm so confident about that that I should do that because, you know, I control the answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can ask whatever you want. So I'm need, gonna need someone from the league to kind of monitor the uh, question and answer and call on people because I don't want to offend anybody by not calling on them. I mean, I was, I was kidding, I was saying. <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, one of the things that you get older, you say you get the filters in the frontal lobe. <laughs> <laughs> it starts to deteriorate a little bit. Uh, uh, you know, as you get over. So I was just talking to the legal women voters last week, and I tended to call on the first three or four who were sitting on this side of the room, and I kind of had to explain what's going on. I said, well, you know, I'm tending left a little bit, so I looked at that side. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, you, okay, you want me? Yeah. No, okay. Yes. So but wait, it's not it on. Takes, it takes a second to come on. Press if the light is on, it's working. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, it's on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Justice Anderson, if I may, I have one question to ask on behalf of the... She uses the English language very well. <laughs> she didn't say, if I can. I know she's a League of Women Voters member. She's completely able to ask, but she said, may I? Uh, if I may, I would like to ask one question on behalf of our League, and then... Uh, leave uh, the rest of the time for questions from the audience. Boy, that's a long question. It, it is, but it's all set up. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the uh, League of Women Voters sponsors an, uh, candidate forums, and in Oct September and October, during the candidate forums, when uh, uh, Minnesota House candidates participated, uh, the uh, uh, candidates were asked to state their position on Minnesota's redistricting process. 
candidates' responses suggest that many candidates have a limited understanding of the redistricting process. Given that fair representation is a core interest of the League of Women Voters, and both the national and state leagues have positions on uh, the redistricting process, what do you recommend that the league do to inform newly elected legislators and other legislators about redistricting, and what kind of advocacy would you recommend if we wanted to achieve a change in law to direct an independent entity to draw district lines and congressional okay. well, First of all, you've got to start out with the premise. It's not one I like, but uh, redistricting tends to break a little bit, like most issues, uh, party lines. Uh, you tend to find the Democrats more amenable to a, uh, you know, redistricting, uh, nonpartisan redistricting group. But that, I mean, many Republicans support that too. So as you go into it, understand that some of your elected representatives come at it from a kind of a knee-jerk, preordained. So what do you do? Uh, you're doing a lot in that, in that's happening is that telling people this is an important issue. And go back to that uh, uh, cartoon I had up there is that you do not want your elected officials choosing who votes for them. You want to be able to choose who is your elected representative. And so you say, and we should do something. And it, you know, Winston Churchill said about democracy, you know, it's the worst form of government you probably design, except it's uh, better than anything else. And so I tend to say that uh, uh, a nonpartisan uh, redistricting panel, truly nonpartisan, is probably the way to go. But it's politics. Politics is power. You've got to be careful. And so it's probably the best alternative. It's interesting. Three states have passed referendums to have nonpartisan commission do redistricting this year. Arizona has it and California has it. And so one is that, you see the last thing, as I said, the educated voter? Well, I should say the educated voter and representative. You need to tell your elected representative this is a big issue. It's important. It's probably not going to be a big issue in here because Minnesota's got, at a minimum, it's got uh, divided government. I've talked to Walls about it. He favors a nonpartisan commission. And uh, because this, uh, you said over there, he said, you know, I said, well, we've been done all right. She says, yeah, but we're not that good. We're just lucky. And uh, there's some truth to it. And so be able to come up with ideas, be able to concede that a nonpartisan commission is not the panacea, the end all or be all, but it's proven to be probably the best way to do it and to not take politics completely out of redistricting, but to minimize it. But you need to get out there and tell the elected representatives this is a priority issue and uh, you want something to be done now when there's a chance to do it. I get some other questions. Yes, sir. What impact has social media had on politics and political campaigns? And what, if anything, can or should we do about it? Okay. You know, I use, I don't use Facebook. I don't use much social media. I, I just uh, don't like hanging out there. Uh, I keep up with some friends. Huh? One of the things when the internet came on, uh, you know, Al Gore didn't invent it, but he funded it. And so I, t I was on a cruise lately with one of the guys who was at the beginning who was, you know, designed. You know why it was that, uh, you know why you have the at sign? You know, it seems to make sense that, you know, uh, Paul, or 425 Justice at, you know, Gmail. You know, and an at makes all kinds of sense. But do they use the, they chose the at sign because the at sign didn't appear in many names. You think about that. You know, you got periods, you got all these other, uh, punctuation signs that appear in names, but the at sign is not a common one in the name, so that's why they chose the at. I mean, he was there explaining how that got. Uh, but when we didn't understand and realize about the internet and email and Google and Facebook is, is that it's collateral consequences. And the collateral consequences are, are really huge. It allows uh, uh, white supremacists and hate people 
to not exist in an isolated world, think that they're alone. They get on these websites and say, oh gosh, there's a lot of people who think the same way I do, okay? And is that it allows for manipulation. I truly believe that the Russians uh, manipulated the election and we need a, uh, you know, uh, uh, an unbiased investigation into it. Uh, it's gonna be a continuing problem. Uh, you've got to be sophisticated consumers. Uh, my wife is a part of a curves uh, work out and go to breakfast, and she is just astounded by how some of the people in her coffee group just believe everything that they see, and they tend to they tend to go and uh, to the websites that they feel familiar with. It. Uh, it's one of the biggest dangers looming for democracy, and the only thing I said is that you've got to talk about be sophisticated. Uh, not, you know, speak out against fake news uh, uh, or, uh, you know, made up facts. Uh, but it's just so hard because people want to believe what they want to believe. I mean, I, I, I've, I've been the victim of some of that stuff that goes on out there. And so you just have to, you know, I'm going to quote Thomas Jefferson. He said, he said, in a democracy, I know of no better repository for the decisive decision-making power than in the people themselves. And if you don't trust them with the vote, the answer is not to take the vote away from them, but it's to educate them. And so I just think we need a massive education program to say, be sophisticated consumers of news. Okay, and social media. Yes. Here, you're letting me down. You're having me call people. Now I'm, next to what happens, I'm going over to the right side here. <laughs> You know, I'm kind of like Lincoln. He's a very pragmatic leader, and as one of his leadership styles is to uh, set your goals on the achievable. I don't think we're going to have people who are incarcerated uh, in prison have the right to vote, and there's some good uh, reason for it. But there's no reason for anybody who see in Minnesota normally. So you get a six-year sentence. Uh, with the way the system works is you're going to serve four years, you're going to have two years on paper. Okay? Uh, I believe strongly that when you get out and you're part of society, and the idea of our correction system is you pay your dues to society and then you come back and become a whole, fully entitled citizen. And, and yeah, you've done something wrong when you're in jail, and maybe you pay some consequences, maybe you don't vote where you're behind bars. But when you come out, we're having you in society and part of society, even if you're under paper. I strongly believe that you should vote. So, I mean, some states have exactly what you you can vote even if you're in prison. Uh, maybe it's, okay. I'm not going to go there because, quite frankly, I don't think it's achievable in this state. But I think getting felons who are out and on paper is achievable. And I'm going to, I've testified before the House on that, and I'll do it again. Yes, ma'am. You saw my, do you have my paper there? <laughs> I say negligence. We have negligence. We can't eliminate negligence. Uh, we can, we. This is not right. Why isn't somebody, why aren't more lawmakers doing something about that? Well, you win elections, you have power, you can do it. Now, now this is, see, this is, I'm, I'm giving you a little bit of hard time, but this is a much more sophisticated question than what uh, you're asking is that uh, I think it should not be allowed when it's overreaching, whatever. But the ultimate decider of what is overreaching in our society right now is the United States Supreme Court, and they decided to take a pass on that issue. They're not going to say that it is. Now, back in Baker versus Carr and Reynolds versus Sims, the Supreme Court took a position. You know, you can't have such really distorted districts. You should strive to achieve one man, one vote. They thought that was enough. 
They didn't uh, count on the sophistication of drawing boundary lines. But it is legal under the law that now exists. If I were on the Supreme Court, I would say there are limits, okay? If I were on the U.S. Supreme Court, I'd say that money doesn't equal speech, okay? But the Supreme Court says that money is equal to speech, okay? So that's why Kavanaugh and Gorsuch were such big deals. Because I don't think that the Supreme Court is going to hold even some of the overreaching on gerrymandering illegal. Because, well, I won't get into that. I don't have time. Uh, yes, ma'am. Well, then it won't be counted. Pardon? It won't be counted. Be the rule it will be is that you've got to answer that question. You have to legally? Well, that's what they're aiming for. But, uh, uh, you know, is it, okay, if you leave it blank, is that ignorance or negligence or whatever? Uh, they'll probably wind up in the court to say, no, you've got to count that person that does everything else right. But that's not where their objective is on this. They don't want somebody to fill out the form at all for fear that ISIS, ICE, you know, ISIS and ICE, you know, I get them mixed up. I'm sorry. <laughs> they're, they're, they're so, they're so, you know, you know, you know, is that, I, and I, I got to be careful, you know, with some of the uh, feelings of being left out and uh, disenfranchised, whatever. There is a lot of similarity. I've, I've got books and articles I've read on it between the left out feeling of many American citizens and the anger that they have. Same thing's going on with ISIS. I mean, it, it radicalizes them. They see these shows of Americans with uh, all the wealth, these young American girls walking around in, you know, skimpy bathing suits, whatever. They uh, make a big deal about objecting to it. I'm not sure this is. But then they, they radicalize themselves and they respond to it. They get fearful and angry. Why are we left out? Why aren't we getting this like they are? Well, they are the devils. You know, we are the devils. Uh, and so that kind of fuels the whole kind of you know, is saying that I'm, I'm, I'm not being treated fair, and so, uh, but uh, back to your question is that uh, it's just kind of, you know, about the way it is. Yes. Um, if, if we would uh, have a neutral panel to <coughs> Oh, you're starting with the wrong premise. You're assuming that they will be neutral people. I mean, I, come on. Okay, I'll give you an example. You know, I, I, I try to approach issues on the court uh, uh, from a perspective, you know, even-handed, whatever. But, you know, when it came to condemnation law, it's kind of hard for me to forget that our family farm that had been in the family from the... Uh, well, back before 1880, the highway department came through and they condemned 11 acres. And they wanted the 11 acres because it was on a hill, because there was some lowland on either side they wanted to fill in. It just happened those 11 acres considered the house, the machine barn, and the well, okay? So <coughs> I am fully aware of the awesome power of the state when it uses condemnation. So when I was deciding on condemnation cases, I had a higher, than some of my colleagues, a tougher standard of what is a public use, because taking somebody's property is big time. My father took that whole process to the grave with him, okay? So, yeah, I try to be even-handed, whatever, but I carry that baggage. So anybody you appoint to a redistricting panel has got some baggage. And so what you want to do is to get people that can set that aside, just like you ask a juror to set that aside when they make a decision, and then get some balance. So you'll have both opinions. That's that's one of the reasons I wanted five instead of three on a redistricting panel. More balance. They would be, you know, is that uh, I, I sat on a seven-member seven court. I like seven. Nine got a little too much. 
I felt a little uncomfortable when there were five justices deciding because it seemed to me at that time, I'm used to seven, it put too much power in one of those justices. That's why I like seven. But anyway, five, I think, would work from the court. We choose them well. And so what you got to do is you're not going to get a whole panel that's neutral. You're going to get people who are committed to the common will and good government. You've got to know that they're going to come with baggage. And you've got to counterbalance that baggage so that, uh, you know, they uh, they all focus on the good and they can kind of uh, use themselves as check and balances on each other. So you try, you strive for neutrality, but I tell you folks, you're not going to get it completely. Yes, sir. So along those lines, uh, I'm asking you if you think there's a practical way that one could limit the criteria that this flawed panel would use. Oh, yeah, there's criteria. Oh, yeah, are you my straight man tonight? <laughs> uh, I had another handout, and this is when the court did redistricting, and here are some of the criteria. I mean, I would talk to some of the people on the redistricting panel. And so, I mean, this this criteria is kind of oriented to when a court does redistricting. So your starting point is the last. You could go back to the map of Minnesota. Uh, when courts, yeah, right there. When courts do it, you know, you start from the last configuration. You know you got the boundaries of the state. And then when a court does it, it's got to be a least change. So, I mean, said, you know, when the court does redistricting, as much as the Republicans wanted to combine Minneapolis and St. Paul, the court doesn't do that. It just doesn't do that. That's too radical a change. It's been separate districts of those two metropolitan areas for too long. And as it, so you don't follow the redistricting plans by the party because you know that they have a bias and orange. You look at them, see what they're proposing, and it's much like a dissent in a court opinion. Oftentimes you read the dissent to fully understand what the majority says, okay? What are the hot button issues here? Same way as you look at the district plans by each side because you see what you know, their objectives are and you can see where they're, they're coming from. Now, uh, one of the other things we did is that uh, when we came to the court, we asked all the parties to present their plans, how, what the court should follow for uh, redistricting, what should be the criteria. Now, the amazing thing about that is that you get about 75, 80% agreement. Okay, so now, okay. And that's the way I used to, to conference cases on the Court of Appeals with three judge panels. I always try to figure out the areas where we agreed first. And then once you get agreement on those areas, well, we don't disagree on all of these things, so let's see how we can work it out. So that you have them submit a plan that you're working on. Now, you follow unique features of communities. One of the good things, and Kalatowski, who was on the first panel, did it, and the other panel did it, they went out state, and they went in state. They went all over, and they asked mayors, county commissioners, public officials, what do you want? And they heard some things like, well, we don't want our city divided up piecemeal, whatever, like Wilmer didn't want itself divided up. You know, and we've got some natural boundaries here, you know. If you're going to do a redistricting, is a, the river's a big boundary here. because, uh, And so you, you listen to what they say, and you try to follow unique natural features. That's why in the south with the I-90 going across there, that was that's not a natural feature, but that is a feature that kind of ties the district together. And so you pay attention to uh, uh, communities. You get their input. You want to be as contiguous as possible. You saw those maps, you know, Goofy kicking Donald and the praying mantis. And, I mean, those are, and if, you, if I showed uh, North Carolina, they got one district that just follows an interstate. It's a small sliver, but it isolates so much of a particular uh, African-American population. And you need to do it in a way that you instill public confidence. So it's got to be an open process. You got to let people know how you're doing it. And, uh, and is it you uh, got to do it so that you promote access to voting, eliminate barriers. I was listening to a program on uh, NPR, and they were talking about this gerrymandering issue. And then the guy said, and then, well, one thing we do is you know, all can agree is that we want everybody to vote. And I wanted to call in and say, boy, you got it wrong. There are people that don't want everybody to vote. And so you got to start with the idea. We're going to figure out how you maximize the number of people. See, 
That's the philosophy of our country. You know, it's, it's life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Jefferson wrote that with a little help and input. You know, John Locke said life, liberty, and property. Jefferson had this problem, he owned people. So he had to come up with something else. He said pursuit of happiness. And if you study what was happening when our country was formed, happiness was a big issue. See, happiness comes from, as a philosophy, it comes from Aristotle and Plato. And it's a, it's a, uh, it's a philosophy and premise of government. And basically, in the, encapsulated, it says government does have a role. That's why I didn't agree with Orban Norsquist. He said, you want to shrink governments to a so small you can drown it in a bathtub. No, that's unpatriotic. I'd call it that to his face. I've done it to others. No, government has a role, but here's what its role is. It is to provide the maximum opportunity for the maximum number of people to achieve happiness. You can't guarantee us. This is where I disagreed with LBJ and Humphrey sometimes. They thought they could almost give a guarantee of happiness. No. I was a VISTA attorney and I saw the welfare rights thing. I said, you can't guarantee people happiness. Money just doesn't guarantee happiness. But you've got to figure out how you provide the opportunity, the pathway, the road by which people can have the opportunity to achieve happiness. That's what it's that's what it's all about. And so, you know, is that you, you, you apply that same kind of idea to redistricting. Government has a role. And it's, uh, it's not going to be perfect. But you've got to figure out a way that people can be satisfied and happy that their uh, voting, their means of revolting, is reasonably secure and uh, bipartisan. Then, uh, you know, implement your plans in a timely manner. So I gave you some, uh, to answer your question, I gave you a handout that has some of the criteria. Uh oh, I'm getting the hook. <laughs> oh, wait a second. Don't I have two minutes or two and a half? Maybe one more question. Maybe? maybe. <laughs> I mean, I would say if we, if we were at 8.30, if at 8.30 we'd say maybe one, but I mean, they're entitled, you know? <laughs> you choose who gets to ask the question. Over there. Yeah, about eight years ago, I was working for an adult uh, need treatment program for mentally challenged adults, and I was driving home. From, all the people came from group homes, and I dropped off that one group home, and I dropped off Sally, and the staff person said, "There's an election day," and she said, "Come on, Sally, we're gonna go vote." And Sally, uh, you know, she probably couldn't do anything about it. But what what is legal as far as uh, you know, mentally challenged adults or people even that? audience with tough questions. Uh, I, don't know. I think they want to put me on the spot. Uh, I mean, we got to be very careful with that. Some people, I mean, they're, they are out in society. They have, and by the way, you have all kinds of spectrums of, of uh, competence out there. I mean, there's some people in group homes, whatever. I mean, they have some really strong opinions. Some of them will watch uh, Fox News, will have strong opinions that way. Others will do that. But uh, you, uh, person was gonna, I'm yeah. assuming, gonna help her. Yeah, no, That's they could not. I mean, what, no, what I would not let the group home person go into the voting booth uh, because then you might be giving the group home person extra votes, yeah. and so you have to, you have to enforce some rules, and so now uh, for a blind person, they can have some assistance, but they will say how it's supposed to vote. I, I, I just don't think that you enable someone to have an extra, uh, extraordinary impact. It's a dicey question because how do you make the judgment call on it? You probably make the judgment call as to let that person vote as to not vote, but you've got to use some, some proper discretion there. Yes. A citizen who can't read English? A citizen who can't read English? They don't exist. I mean, not anymore, they don't. I mean, haven't they all been deported? <laughs> hey, someone who doesn't speak English may be more intelligent than either you and I and may know more about voting than either of us. I was a big advocate on the court about getting uh, proper interpreters in the court when people were coming into the court and uh, having their rights uh, uh, jeopardized or in, in play, and so I made sure that we had interpreters and we did it well. They vote. They're a citizen. They qualify. 
I'm not sure how they got the citizenship because they had to ask some questions in order to pass, but they, they but anyway, I mean, you have a lot of people, some people who are kind of limited in English, whatever. They're a citizen. We have decided they are a citizen, and so as uh, we provide means by which we do some interpretation so they can cast an intelligent vote. Okay. And who's to say that they aren't a more intelligent voter than either you or I, you know? So, oh, she's going to kick me off now. Well, uh, thank you but for having thank me. You every uh, <laughs> I, uh, I hope you leave with a better understanding of what gerrymandering is about, uh, an understanding about the right of vote, how precious it is. It truly is. I mean, it's your right to revolt. You know, we have peaceful revolutions here, and you've got to protect that right as best you can. And uh, as Jefferson said, don't take the vote away from people. Educate them. Thank you much. Very well. Yeah, thank you very much for coming.